Hello, my name is Amanda Poss. I'm the gallery director for Hillsborough Community College. I'm so delighted to be introducing tonight's event, the first for Gallery 114 at HCC Ybor City campus since the start of the pandemic. And we're presenting you with a new multimedia installation by none other than Ryan McCullough. This is a thoughtful and contemplative exhibition called Themes for the American Kestrel. And it's a layered a contemplation of perception and observation that touches on the past as well as the present. Themes for the American Kestrel is on view at the Ybor City campus now through April 29th. You can view this exhibition yourself by making an appointment on our website, hccfl.edu slash gallery 114. I'd like to say a few quick notes about our Zoom meeting before we get started with tonight's event. As you may have noticed, we are recording. If you would like to know when this is available, simply subscribe to our YouTube channel at Gallery221HCC, which is used for all HCC visual art gallery programs. And for the best experience of our event tonight in Zoom, we recommend using the view icon on your top right and select speaker view. For clarity, everyone except speakers will be muted. However, that doesn't mean we don't wanna hear from you. In fact, we welcome your participation just in the chat section. This is where we will look for questions during your Q&A, which will occur at the end of the event. So just leave your questions in the chat at any time and we'll address them in the order in which they appear. But feel free to use this to leave comments and reactions as we go along as well. Um, I would like to say a, a few words of welcome on behalf of our campus president, Dr. Ginger Clark for the Ybor City campus, who unfortunately wasn't able to join us tonight. Um, I know she wanted to express her gratitude for having RISE exhibition here at HCC Ybor City campus, especially since this is the first one we've had since it closed a year ago now in March of 2020. And then I have a few words of thanks before I introduce the artist. We are deeply grateful for the support of the HCC Student Activities and Services in SGA, whose funding makes our exhibitions possible throughout the year. We're also fortunate to have the support locally with our administration of Dr. Keith Berry, Dean for Associate and Arts Programs at HCC Ybor City Campus and Dr. Ginger Clark, the Ybor City Campus President. I also always like to extend my personal thanks to the contributions of the gallery team, Emiliano Sedacasi and Michael Murphy. We also have Davion, our student worker, who's behind the scenes with us tonight. They each deserve special recognition for their efforts in facilitating numerous aspects of the exhibition from planning to installation. And I extend my appreciation to all others who worked in support of this exhibition from the college to our surrounding community. Finally, last but not least, my thanks to our artist, Ryan McCullough, for sharing his time and talents with us. We're honored to host this exhibition and brand new work by him. So um, I'm going to read uh, Ryan McCullough's bio, but before I do that, just a quick reminder, of, reminder for those of you who are just now filtering in, um, we will end with some Q&A. So please, I highly encourage you to type your questions into the chat at any point of the event. Um, and especially if you're a student, let us know and we'll try to get to your questions in particular. So Rai, I see he's already um, unmuting himself and video on. So a little bit about Rai McCullough. Rai McCullough is an artist and educator working in Tampa, Florida. He has exhibited nationally and internationally and is the founder of the Standard Action Press Collaborative Zine Project. He earned his Bachelor of Fine Arts from Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio, where he concentrated in the areas of printmaking and sculpture. Upon completion of his undergraduate work, he served as the Director of Sculptural Studies, as well as teaching printmaking at Stiver School for the Arts. McCullough received his MFA in printmaking and book arts from the Lamar Dodd School of Art at the University of Georgia, and he is currently serving the Department of Art and Design as an Assistant Professor of Art at the University of Tampa. Now, Rai, um, as all of that bio suggests, you are perhaps most well known as a printmaker. However, as the show indicates, your work encompasses a wide variety of media approaches and processes. Can you tell us a little bit more about your studio practice and how it's evolved over time? Absolutely. Uh, but first, if I could kind of take a, a little left turn, I just want to start with some gratitude um, for all the work that Amanda and her team, uh, Emiliano, Michael, 
have put into the exhibition and supporting it. Um, just absolutely the best people to work with and uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I also wanna thank HCC for hosting the exhibition. Uh, I know that that is, is always kind of, there, there are a lot of people to choose from and I'm incredibly grateful that uh, you selected my work. Um, and then I would also like to uh, extend a thank you to Terry Bluebird, who was uh, my assistant in putting this show uh, together in the installation. Uh, so thank you, Terry. And then most of all, um, I wanna thank my family. I think that we all kind of understand that right now, how complex everything is. Um, if one if one artist in a family is doing an exhibition, that means another one is not. And I um, just want to recognize um, how much my my wife and partner Janelle Young has done uh, for me and support me uh, to make this exhibition possible. So, thank you. Uh, all right, to to recenter to uh, your question as far as my uh, my development, uh, I think I I you could start back at my time at Wright State. And I think that's a good place to start to think about how uh, divergent practices have always been a part of what I do as an artist. Uh, I kind of came through the sculpture department and uh, that it was a very experimental department. So we were doing a lot of uh, performance, installation, earthworks, anything that did not feel like traditional art object making. Um, but then of course I was also taking drawing classes and photography classes and printmaking classes. Um, and I remember kind of really kind of like a sharp memory in my mind uh, when I took a drawing class and my instructor uh, informed me that I was the worst drawing student that she had ever had. And uh, I had no hand sensitivity. And so she encouraged me to uh, look into printmaking. And so uh, I took a relief class and I kind of understood what she meant that I needed some sort of kind of physical um, force uh, to create a drawing. And so at that time, I was making prints about my sculpture and eventually sculpture about my prints. And so this dialogue between different disciplines was happening pretty early on. Um, I kind of like the, the question about being a printmaker and um, you know, to be a printmaker, one should make prints, right? If you're a plumber, you plumb. Um, but uh, for me, the, the interest in printmaking maybe has not necessarily been the, the final product, the, the printed image. Um, what I love about printmaking is really the discourse of printmaking. Um, there's always this uh, removed relationship from the art object. For instance, I'm carving the wood block, but the wood block is not the art. Um, I'm scratching into the copper plate, but the copper plate is not the art. Um, and I, I think that's kind of a beautiful, that's a beautiful relationship to have. And, you know, it, it started to inform my content as far as like talking about subjects and ideas a little more obliquely. Um, <clears throat> I think that there is this kind of call and response that happens um, within printmaking because of that kind of indexical relationship between matrix and substrate. And I think that acts as kind of a conversational, um, kind of a, a, a structure that I, I tend to follow through all the things I, I have made, whether that is casting, um, doing molds and cast in sculpture, or whether that is casting things with handmade paper, um, or doing kind of like direct uh, printing from physical matrix. Um, I think that is really the groundwork for what I do. And you can see that in this exhibition, that it is about different uh, conversations between disciplines to almost heighten their specific uh, qualities or their inherent qualities and, and their deficiencies. I also... I Oh, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. <laughs> uh, if, if, uh, if Emiliano, if you want to uh, share some of those early images uh, that I had sent. Uh, so this is a great example of um, of uh, a, a work that I had created. Um, that, that highlights this relationship between diversity in discipline and allowing 
different kinds of forms to communicate and create tension or to create compliment or just kind of create a sense of energy. This is, um, this is an installation from the Georgia Museum of Art. This was my, this was my thesis exhibition for graduate school. And it's comprised of uh, like 100 and like 120 uh, discrete objects and images and was paired with a book. And so there's always this kind of um, opportunity to look at something and kind of see something else in your periphery. There's always something else that is in dialogue with uh, the main viewing experience. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, this was a, a work that came directly after that installation and uh, definitely informed uh, a move towards uh, non-objective uh, abstraction and materialist-based abstraction. And this is uh, a triptych of handmade paper, cast paper. It was cast into a concrete floor and you can kind of see some of the evidence um, of that the texture of that floor. Um, this kind of interest in um, kind of like an index or something that shows like the, the evidence of direct contact but not necessarily having direct contact is something that um, uh, kind of became consistent. But um, I also started to really become uh, more interested in all of these little diverse pieces and parts, these little collage um, components that you see in the composition and if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, this is a, a piece of sculpture that it's kind of taking a collage mentality into um, objects that could be discovered. They could be real. Um, and they, they kind of have this partner relationship. And they start to uh, generate a conversation and really asking the viewer to look and look again and to look a little more closely. Um, but these are, in my opinion, these still exist as collage. Um, and once I uh, moved to Tampa, um, as you can see, everything I was making was black and white. It all kind of like hung out in the, in the monochrome. And once I came to Tampa, just everything about it, the energy, um, culture, food, music, uh, it really um, inspired me to invite color into my practice. Um, and so I started to make, um, I started to generate uh, printed materials through traditional printmaking processes. I think whenever you start teaching, uh, you kind of re, you kind of rejoin with your first love of the making processes. So I was like screen printing woodcut, um, and then I would chop them up and make these kind of little Frankenstein's out of the bits and pieces. And I liked uh, these as like the challenge to make a, a proposed object out of collage material in a drawn space. The next image is um, maybe like an architectural idea, like a fantasy architectural idea using these kinds of collage tidbits. Um, the next image that you'll see, sorry, I'm trying to whip through these because my, uh, you know, the development is like a long, it's a long tail and I'm trying to keep it tight. Um, and then for these, uh, you can see that there's this halftone background and it generates a, a real visual vibration and almost creates like an atmospheric condition where um, these particles or these pieces and these fragments are kind of floating in space. Um, and then finally, um, kind of with all of that, kind of that head of steam and kind of that research, I started to make uh, larger wall installations from um, wood blocks that could be used uh, for printmaking, but th this is uh, an improvised uh, composition uh, where I just had uh, a box of these prepared wood blocks, kind of a vocabulary of objects that would then have the opportunity to play out in the gallery through kind of like um, my intervention. I, I didn't feel like that was rushing through at all. I love seeing the trajectory from black and white and this dialogue between media in, into fantastic color and that you are so influenced by Tampa, Florida. I think a lot of people who have moved here um, from other places like up north, which you and I share, uh, feel that infusion of tropical colors when they, when they move to Florida. And I see that just so wonderfully celebrated in your work. Um, I want to shift now and talk a little bit about the title for this exhibition in Gallery 114, 
themes for the American Kestrel, which is so striking. And it creates this lovely point of departure and investigation into the objects that are presented. Uh, please explain for us the inspiration for the show and its connection to the Kestrel. Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, it's hard to think about any of this work with kind of like removing it from uh, our context of, of like spending time quarantine and in quarantine and kind of dealing with yourself. I think everyone has probably had that experience more than once, or maybe it's like a long uh, trajectory of dealing <laughs> with yourself. Um, but I think as an artist, uh, I try my best to have a studio practice that is self-reflective and in some way uh, teaches me how to be a better human through making art objects and thinking about ideas more deeply. Um, I remember it was about two weeks into the beginning of like kind of our quarantine and a friend of mine uh, sent a picture and it was just a, a picture of clouds and it was really poetic, but she said, how can I ever make the same things after all of this as an artist? How can I have that kind of, you know, with all of this upheaval, complexity, um, how can I ever make the same thing again? And so, um, you know, I was making these really colorful, kind of bubbly, uh, really, I, I think kind of, there was a lot of levity to the work that I was making. Um, and not that I wanted to turn away from that, but I definitely wanted to approach subject matter again. And instead of just materialist abstraction of like, here's a shape, here's a shape, and they have a relationship formally, um, it was really important for me to start to um, at least ask myself the questions of like, why am I doing that? And of course, being in your house for long stretches of time, uh, you have to figure out ways to kind of have a rich interior life. And uh, being out in the backyard, uh, any, of, any of you that are uh, here from Tampa, you know that birds are everywhere. And that becomes like, as I'm sitting there, I'm kind of like the static element and there's all these birds that are moving around me and there's just so much energy and color and um, kind of just gestures. Um, I became really into backyard bird watching and I have a little book that I tote with me in my backyard. Uh, and I'm flipping through it and, and uh, I come upon this uh, really a beautiful bird, the American kestrel. And it's, a, it's like a small, very small bird of prey. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's, uh, like a sparrow hawk or a falcon. And I just thought, one, it, it reminded me of a Brancusi sculpture. Like it's just, there's something so formally perfect and beautiful about it. Um, and that kind of the quest to encounter a kestrel just like gave my antenna all of the energy that I needed. And I started to like pay attention. I would go on walks and I'm paying attention in a different way than I was before. And it was, there was an awareness and there was like an acknowledgement of like, I'm seeking something out. I'm like uh, waiting for like the arrival because then you start generating uh, all of this intention as you're walking around, as you go to the backyard, you're kind of excited to go outside. Um, and so that became this um, kind of a larger, like a lifestyle theme that was changing and I could feel it, uh, that I wanted to pay more attention. I wanted to be more observant. I wanted to be more aware of myself in the world. And at right around the same time, there's so much synchronicity when, when projects develop. Any artist knows that sometimes you're just like looking for the signs. And so um, the other thing that kind of crossed my path at that same time was uh, uh, an article written by John Berger in 1955 about the artist Giorgio Morandi. Um, and if any of you, I think we'll, we'll talk about Giorgio Morandi a little bit later, but Giorgio Morandi was kind of like, in my opinion, uh, like the most curious master of still life painting. They're like, they're like, I would say they're like sushi. They're just a perfect um, essence of, yes, on, on the right hand side, just a perfect essence of, of form and like these, these great kind of uh, studies of subtlety. And they're also kind of funky. Uh, as well, which I love. They feel utterly handmade. There's not 
like a slickness or a sexiness to these objects that they feel like they were um, like right off of the end of his brush. And I think that um, thinking about this parallel, I was starting to draw this parallel, this conversation between backyard bird watching and still life as a kind of an intellectual practice or an intellectual pursuit. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about kind of the myth of Mirandi um, because I think it, it directly relates to this. Um, and so I started to build a stock of objects, not different than a lot of my other projects where I just start making things um, and they start to kind of accumulate and my tables become full. And I'm noticing they're, they're kind of like boxes. There we go. They're kind of these boxes and kind of nothings, you know, kind of nothings and, and everythings. And I'm probably responding to like form and color and texture or just kind of a mystery about these particular objects. And I start the process of making many, many two inch by two inch little still life drawings. Like I was so, for some reason, I was so tentative to step out of non-objective abstraction. I almost had these little, like I was making still lifes as a secret to myself. You know, that's how you know, that's how I knew it was real, that I had to acknowledge that there was like this energy that was bubbling up a lot of this kind of force that was uh, starting to push um, as far as the things I wanted to investigate. There's a lot there, so much to unpack. I was jotting notes. Um, <laughs> starting at talking about that you're using art to, to teach you how to be a better human through that process. I think that's quite inspirational in and of itself, but that note about curiosity and, and the marriage of bird watching and still life is intellectual pursuit, I found quite fantastic. Um, so let's delve into a little bit more about the objects. For anyone who hasn't seen the show, I recommend you go and see it in person. Um, the various artworks are presented in three kind of categories or three distinct forms. We have the three-dimensional kestrel objects, which we saw a moment ago. And so that's the pre-existing versions of everyday objects from felt to sticks and um, the objects that then reproduce or reference those same items. And then we have, as you can see behind there, this two-dimensional imaging of those objects through printmaking and collage. And finally, the video that's included in which the Kestrel objects are subtly shifted and changed in a seemingly endless fashion. It reminds me of so all sorts of things, um, semiology, the, the conceptual play inherent in artworks like Joseph Kosu's One and Three Chairs. Um, and in that relationship, I also think about in your work, how you reference this idea of like, which is which, the, which is the object, right? And, and Kosu, this, which is the chair, um, and this idea of real versus unreal. So there's all these different layers. So for someone who comes to see the show, what overall message, effect, or questions are you hoping that this kind of play between objects evokes in the mind of the viewer? Well, I'm, I'm happy that you brought up, brought up Joseph Kosuth. Um, and it's, uh, as you kind of posed this question earlier, I kind of forgot that when I was an undergrad, Kosuth was a visiting artist at Wright State. And it, I guess it had a, a, a a subliminal, subliminal uh, effect, but uh, it's kind of nice to see that come back around. Uh, you know, when it comes to this exhibition, I really like to, uh, I almost liken it to like a loop. Like you start hearing the same thing said in different ways over and over and over again, and you start forgetting where the origin point was. And I think that what I really hope is that I'm starting to create like an atmosphere of ideas that starts to implicate the viewer. It starts to like the subject is the viewer's experience rather than like the, uh, like the sexy sculpture that stands on the pedestal, you know, or the kind of incredibly facile um, drawing or painting. And you're like, oh my gosh, it looks photographic. It looks so real. Like there's something about breaking that um, that was important for me in this because I wanted people to come in and kind of question the validity of every step. Um, I do have, I do have some, uh, some notes on each specific um, 
group of, of material that's presented. So for the objects, uh, if you haven't seen in any of the images, they are super handmade. They're overtly handmade. They are funky. They're poetic. They're kind of scrappy. Uh, you can see tape and rough edges. There's like cracks in it. Uh, this, at first, it, it does seem like kind of like an offhandedness or a nonchalance that those objects have, but I, I believe that the, that is what really gives those objects power um, because it's, it's um, pure evidence that it is a singular engagement with that material. Um, there are a lot of artists and a lot of traditions that are about removing the hand from the art object to say, you know, this just arrived out of like fog and mist and a little seven up, like it, it just appeared. But I wanted these to almost have the appearance that they're still warm from my hand. They're so like fresh, like, and, and I think trying to capture that kind of direct engagement was really important to me. <laughs> um, I think that that also the kind of the funkiness makes them so desirable to touch. Like there is an in, like an undeniable invitation when you see something that is like humble and crusty and you're like, what is that little thing? You know, like I'm sure everyone here has gone on a walk and you see like a stone or a stick and you don't know why, but you're just compelled to pick it up. You are compelled to kind of like, oh, there's a little something and I'm going to put it in my pocket and you hold on to it. And it, it, it creates this kind of energy and it creates this kind of bond with you uh, that I think is, is really significant. And I think about it, I've been doing that my entire life. I literally have uh, Rubbermaid totes in my storage unit of just the little junk that I've collected my entire life. And there's some kind of formal um, attraction I have, some textural attraction, but sometimes they just are mysterious and kind of um, like they have their own thing going on and, and they come into my orbit. Um, I think that definitely stands as like some sort of like a sign to me that we're looking for objects to um, use as like a reflection, like a moment of reflection. Like if you are going to meditate and I'm going to stare at this rock or something like that, or it allows me to displace the stress of the world into this mysterious little object. Um, and so most of these, most of the objects here, they kind of exist like that, whether I found them, whether I've kind of found them and then altered them, whether I've crafted them out of paper. Um, I also think that when we look at these, like, there are specifically three platforms um, that are in the main space. And when someone walks into, into the gallery, they encounter one of the small platforms. And it has, we just saw it, uh, it just has a kind of like a sparse arrangement of objects. You can see it on the lower left here. And then you kind of observe those and say, all right, this is kind of interesting. These are kind of weird, funky little nuggets. And then you go to the larger, array and it is kind of a bouquet of color texture and form and then to the right of that large platform is a nearly identical platform to the first that you encountered when you walked into the space and so uh, what i really liked to think about with those objects is almost like kind of sameness or things that are close to being replicas uh, experience that's like another experience, uh, maybe uh, creating a brick out of paper, you know, like there's like a, an absurdity to how these objects start to feed off of each other as um, an ensemble. I don't know if I could ever see them as like soloists, but they start to uh, contaminate each other and they start to kind of like generate energy from um, the relationships that they build together. Um, now, as far as kind of how those became the images, I think that also makes things a little more slippery and kind of fun. Um, I think that uh, the challenge of like organizing pictorial space, like to make an image, to make a picture, is like one of the most epic tasks 
ever that an artist can take on. Um, and it's very old. It's a very old um, tradition that you're in. You're in dialogue with like how pictures work, how we move an eye, the eye of the viewer around, how we um, collect space, both positive and negative, and use that to create force and tension and balance in an image. That was exactly what I engaged in. Like I just wanted to make damn good pictures and things that are um, just really, you know, energetic and um, there was a flow to them. Um, but I think that like there was another layer behind that that interested me that made it essential to the project. And that's what happens when you make available the subject matter that images have, that, are, that they're presenting. So if you can look at an object that's on the pedestal and kind of find it in a picture. For one, you're starting to engage someone and you're starting to kind of like include them. Like I find a lot of contemporary art is like so complex and wound up with itself that there's the most like uh, minimal invitation for people to kind of engage with it. And I wanted that to be a very direct connection of like, you know, you know, to be the Beatles, for someone to have no frame of reference to contemporary art and art history and be able to kind of enjoy the experience of seeing how these objects exist uh, in a physical three-dimensional form and how they exist in a two-dimensional form. Like, I think that is just, you know, a way to generate energy with a very old form. Like, um, and I know we're going to talk about still life a little bit later, so I won't get ahead of myself. Um, but, you know, what also is happening, and, and this is something that is a belief that I developed through this project, is that you have the realization that once you paint or draw or make an image of something, that that image is no longer itself. Like the Magritte, this is not a pipe. Um, I think that's really important. It's an image of a pipe. And these become images, and therefore the objects that they are referencing, they're not really the same thing anymore. They've transformed. Um, and in some way, the sculpture of a cup is not for drinking any longer. The sculpture of a cup is intended to be observed and to be in dialogue with the artist and then to be in dialogue with the viewer. So I think there's this kind of dislocation that happens that's really interesting um, when you have subject and object tensions or kind of um, co-minglings that are starting to happen. Um, and then finally, the third kind of container for uh, information in this exhibition, it's kind of the last stop as you, as you move around the space um, kind of clockwise, is a, it's a video on a flat screen, just a single channel video on a flat screen. And um, this is kind of what I did for weeks and weeks. I set up a little still life and I would draw it and so all I did was take a video of me um, rearranging all of the still life objects that I had accumulated over those weeks. And I simply removed my hand from the video. It's not a stop motion, which would be kind of like a still photograph. You will see that there is the changing of kind of temperature of light and shadows will increase. There's more contrast. It's because all of this is natural light from my studio windows. And that kind of like ambient shift, I think really speaks to the passage of time. And if anything, the interruption or kind of the slipperiness of the passage of time when you're engaging with still life and with objects in general. Again, providing like so many rich layers here. Like I think this idea of passage of time and, and observation being at home, so many people can relate to. Um, but I also love what you said, how this show is so, uh, rich in material transformations um, and organizing pictorial space as this epic task, which I think is really, again, a lovely note for our students who might be watching what they're doing is this epic task into, you know, space and, and organization. Um, so now talking about observation and perspectival shifts, uh, which you've mentioned here, they're so integral to the exhibition, um, but it's also anchored into the historical tradition of the still life, as you were hinting. Um, still life being the arrangement of static objects drawn from life and the controlled environment of the studio, um, 
you know, this was often used by artists as a tool to hone technique and has a powerful tradition of being used to convey symbolic and cultural messages. And then you take it another step in your reference to Giorgio Morandi, for example, um, in that you are also actively working to upend that typically still silent quality of still lives by affirming that observation is this ongoing process. So what is it about the tradition of the still life, this historical model, right, that you found so appealing as a vehicle to discuss observation for now? Oh, there's a lot. There's a lot there. Um, I think that's a. I think that's a great question. Um, I kind of want to start from the beginning of that, and I just I like still life as um, as this kind of monolith, you know. And and even though it is this kind of haggard thing, everyone's like it's out of fashion or it's, you know, overused or it's just done. Like to me, that's the perfect reason to engage with it. Um, and if you think about it, there have been contemporary artists that have continued to engage with still life um, for their own reasons. And they're reviving it, they're revitalizing it. They're trying to like wring out as much juice from that form as they possibly can. Now for me, um, I, I was kind of alluding to that earlier that still lives, like they can run this parallel mission for me in my studio, like I can, in my studio today, I can sit here and I can be a picture maker and I can almost like engage with like an antique process of, of building pictures out of static objects. But then to think about still life and I'm not being like, I'm trying not to be cheeky, but like think about how much we've slowed down. Think about how much we have changed in almost one year like almost one year. Uh, uh, almost one year ago. For uh, one year ago is I think when we kind of stopped mm -hmm. and um, how we have, how we kind of busied ourselves. And it was just like, there was always a go, go, go. Well, all of a sudden we had to, we had to be stationary and to kind of call back to Mirandi. Um, I also, forgot to mention to you that when I was an undergrad, I, I got to go to Italy and visit his, the recreation of his studio, which was in his house, in his, in his room. And it's just a humble little table with canvas draped over it. And there was a shelf with a stock of objects. And it's, it's pretty well documented that Morandi engaged in arranging and rearranging for much longer and for much more of an intense period of time than it took to him act, for him to actually paint them. And so I just loved that idea. And it, and it kind of struck me similar to the backyard bird watching of like, this is a rich interior life. If I can slow myself down and I can see the drama in the lemon being here as opposed to here, like I, I saw that as being really worthy uh, material to take on, uh, even if it was just going to be for when quarantine was what I thought that was going to be. Um, I think that um, when we think about still life, um, kind of big picture, and, and thinking about kind of what still life can do, uh, and, and maybe we can pull up that still life of the Matisse next to the Mirandi, um, this Henri Matisse uh, painting the blue window in 1913. Uh, the first time it was reproduced in a publication was 1914. And it had the title um, was it Unsilvered Glass, which was a, a tool that painters and, and artists used to look at their subject matter backwards, to think about the arrangement. And I love that kind of like the removal like that feels a bit like what we're doing right now. And I know we're gonna get into that in, in just a little bit, but Henri Matisse is starting to make this kind of um, a little bit of a kind of a hint at how meta still life can become to be looking at something and it's about the process of looking at something and it's titled in a way that reinforces that as the priority for it. Uh, I also think that looking at some of the, you know, some of my still, my favorite still lifes in art history. Um, this Matisse on the left, like it's so 
wonderfully complex and ridiculous. There are some like uh, flattening of space. There is a kind of rendering of some objects and that is not consistent in the composition. Um, there's also this kind of uh, introduction of like interior exterior and I just felt like this was one of those like mantras as an image it was kind of a mantra for me uh, for the last year and of course every all of the late works of Giorgio Morandi he had this kind of like monastic um, practice like he didn't really travel the world he kind of like stayed in Bologna and really stayed in his in his little room studio and there are just so many subtle shifts and it's the same kind of thing when I look at a Mirandi I'm slowing myself down to notice the small kind of changes taking place and soon it becomes an entire symphony and I require kind of less bravado I require less kind of like noise and energy like there's a different kind of energy that's under the surface and i really love that about um, still life i hope that answers your question yes wonderfully and i think that's a, a really good segue thing about the interior to exterior coming back to your your bird watching because this all for me comes back to the kestrel which appears in the show as a paper sculpture in the space high above the viewer's head and there's this fantastic sense of am I watching the kestrel or does the kestrel watch me? That really reinforces the theme of observation in the show. And I can't help but think as we sit here on Zoom um, about the technological tools that we've engaged with through the pandemic. We're sitting here, right, engaging in that right now. And leads me to think about the act of observation in the digital age, especially at a time when our experience are often mediated through um, virtual space. Um, in the exhibition brochure, you say this so lovely, so I'm going to quote you. You say, I sit and the bird arrives or the bird sits and I arrive or not. So how do all these things coalesce in the show? Um, well, I hope they coalesce in the show. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that from kind of my, my early making life, I think this idea of um, mediated experience is has always been a part of my work. Um, I think that's part of kind of the DNA of, of being a printmaker and having training in printmaking, um, as I was discussing before. Um, I also think that um, the idea of like that, that quote um, was, was kind of a thought I had after um, reading The Waves by Virginia Woolf. And there's this, uh, uh, many references to birds throughout that uh, that book, but it's really a, a book that's about um, individual consciousness and uh, community consciousness or collective consciousness. And I think that uh, we are definitely living in a time where uh, that line is becoming really blurry and kind of understanding uh, when we're when we're being watched or um, like how we're being watched. But then what's more important to me, is kind of the emotional effect of like, when we were in our house for two months and we didn't see anyone in like in like person face to face, there was something about a mediated conversation that was really special. And not to sound kind of really hyperbolic, but to kind of be seen, to be observed is an acknowledgement of like, I'm here, I'm, I'm valid. And I am like, I'm having, I'm having a, um, an experience over here, whether it's challenging or ecstatic or all of those things. But I think that there's a necessity and a relationship between kind of the viewer and the viewed, the what is observed and, and the observer. And so of course the Kestrel became this kind of emblematic stand-in for that of like, I'm, I was always looking for the bird, you know? Um, and so there was this desire for me to observe this, this thing. And so I also think that we have, we have the opportunity to step away at any moment. Um, and so that's why I think that like, it's, it's completely like our choice to be engaged with that, that uh, 
reciprocal relationship of, of observing and being observed. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question, but before I do that, remind our audience, I see some questions have already come in. So if you're you know, all of this uh, kind of wash over you and you have some thoughts you'd like to share and ask the artist now is a really good time to do that. So my last question for you is, uh, I mean, we've been talking about this deeply contemplative, conceptual and, and the psychological components for your show. And they're very well balanced with also this sense of humor and wit. I love, for example, personally, the shriveled little orange juxtaposed with a similarly sized orange ball, right? Um, or the standing branch that always, for me, it reminds me of a bird's foot. Um, how does humor or irony play a role in your process? Um, I think, you know, obviously, we're kind of touching on some really deep and very human kind of universal ideas in in my kind of in my life when you're trying to engage with really like truly meaningful and deep content uh, you don't start with kind of a punch to the face like that the road to that has always been more productive through an engagement through humor and through levity and through creating connection with someone and so even if it's like a formal kind of a formal humor that exists in the objects like you were referencing. I kind of think about, um, and of course we've all had plenty of time to uh, watch all kinds of uh, stand-up comedy, but thinking about really profound, beautiful comedians and how they use a callback to generate humor. Um, I think that that's something I'm influenced by and I think that you see it all over the place in this particular show of like, it's, it's kind of an orange, it's an orange, it's not an orange. I think that's hilarious. I think, I, I think that kind of, um, it's almost like wordplay, but with visual, um, with kind of visual components. And of course, of course the, the titles are um, really flat footed. And so if you have a dry sense of humor, uh, I hope you enjoy them. Uh, I think, <laughs> I think that uh, the objects themselves are kind of a ridiculous proposition as sculpture. Um, I'm, I'm one of the lucky, uh, and many people have, have seen the David in Italy. I'm, I feel really blessed and lucky that I, I was able to see that. That's like sculpture. Like when I was, before I even knew what art was, like that was the image of sculpture. And it's beautiful, undeniably beautiful, surprisingly beautiful. You turn the corner, you see it, and it hits you right in the gut. And you're just like, oh, that's not really happening in this show. This is a little bit more of like, um, like the stumble bum in an old, in an old comedy of like, uh, there's something kind of like endearing and universal and hapless about some of these objects. And I, I think that it is uh, worth taking the time to create an, an exhibition that has a layer of just pure enjoyment, pure kind of like human, like a desire to connect in a very human way. And that happens for me uh, through, through humor and, and comedy. I think that's so appropriate for now. Um, my favorite of the titles happens to be Still Life with Dark Nugget, which is the first uh, artwork you see when you come into the room. Um, I'm gonna turn now to questions from our audience. Uh, Jen McCullough asks, Rye, is the architectural piece a close floor plan of your house? I think that was in reference to um, Idle Handed Constellation. Um, they were... <laughs> It's possible that there were there might be some uh, similarities to my bookshelves being, <laughs> being kind of full and teetered and tottering. Uh, yeah. Hi, cousin Jen. I love you. <laughs> we bring it back to family, right? Um, we have a comment from Babs Ringgold says that she agreed with some of your earlier statements. She also loves Mirandi's work. Um, and then Barbara Stubbs asks is slowing down and observing a practice that you encourage in your students? That's, that's a great question. Uh, I do teach, I've, I've taught observational drawing for uh, five years, six years. Um, 
and I would say that absolutely, I almost teach um, observational drawing. They all, my, my students will joke that I teach it more like yoga um, because we do kind of body exercises like stretching, breathing, enacting kind of like a sense of awareness of your kind of like your physical instrument before you even get to the pencil. And so thinking about a state of, of presence um, is a different kind of observation than like hardcore trying to improve your mimetic powers. I think that it's a larger thing. Even in my teaching, it's a larger thing than just make this look like this. I hope that answers your question. It's good hey, to see you, Barb. Yeah, we even got a response, I think, from someone who's been in one of these yoga slash drawing classes. Uh, uh, uh -oh. says, yes, stretches every class. But I think that's <laughs> lovely to bring that dynamic of it's not just eye, mind, hand. It's, it's your body that is engaged. And what a wonderful way to bring that back. Barbara says, thank you so much. Um, another comment from Marjorie Green uh, saying you have a wonderful talk that you elevate printmaking in both an historic and contemporary way. Many thanks. Um, Molly Evans, yes to the callback, laughed out loud in the gallery today over the observation of that shriveled orange. Thanks for coming to see the show, Molly. I, as I mentioned, really love that too. Um, I, you know, still a little time for questions. And so I'll, I'll kind of go back to one of my own. Um, as we see, you have some students here. So what advice do you have for emerging aspiring artists like students who are watching right now? I think that um, my advice to students is like be audacious, like have the bravery to engage with big ideas. I think it can be really embarrassing sometimes. I remember being embarrassed when I was like taking myself so seriously when I was young, but now I'm so thankful that I did, um, you know, that I was making sculpture and performance and installation in Dayton, Ohio. It's like, that was everything, you know, it, it was important. And I think that um, endow yourself with a sense of importance that every drawing or every sculpture that you make actually has meaning and impact and it kind of moves out into the world. It, is a force of your kind of positive energy. And so I think be prolific and, and uh, be audacious. Fantastic. Um, we have another question from Kathy Gibson. She says, Rye, I noticed there was one piece in the exhibit that had three horizon lines instead of the two in the other pieces. Any fantastic reason or just because you wanted to see, to see the color play or dot, dot, dot. Uh, I, I think that um, a lot of the kind of backgrounds, they really function like, uh, like I'm a huge fan of Joseph Albers and I, I was able to satisfy, I, I tend to kind of make projects that I satisfy my little, um, like our historical dreams, um, by, by kind of setting up a specific circumstance, but I love these kind of like top and bottom color combos. Um, with that one, um, I needed to just have one suggestion that this was in fact a tabletop that is being referenced and re-referenced throughout. So it was just, I just needed one little bell to ring. It always, I like that you mentioned filling your art historical dreams. It always seems to me a little bit like Cezanne's apples, right? The, the reference of the table, but what a keen eye from Kathy. Great question. Yeah. Um, so we have another, you know, so a few comments, people responding to the show. Lynn Foskett says she enjoys your work very much and appreciate the poetic articulation that you bring to your work. Um, and I think one of another one of your students, Don Scott, says, wait, we don't stretch in printmaking, bring it. So I think you're setting up for, for more stretches in your classes, like <laughs> the body, the hand, and mind. Um, and we have a question from Michael Standard says, sorry, he wasn't here from the beginning, but he was wondering how you imagine the still life pieces and the wall as interrelated. So you give a quick little explanation of how those connect together. Sure. I think that proximity is one way that they have, um, they have a relationship. And Emiliano, I'm going to put you to the test if you can. If there's a shot of the first platform um, with uh, framed work behind it. You can actually see some of the objects in the same kind of, 
you know, the line of sight objects in, in images directly. So um, one thing that I didn't really talk about, yeah, if you see um, this platform, you can see a little orange by a, a pink paper beer can. Uh, you can see that orange uh, in the composition behind it. And so you kind of like, that's one of those like, uh, you know, in old films, there's like a cigarette burn where they change, uh, where they change kind of the film. It's like one of those things where it's like, wait a second, what did I just see? And you start to start like build connections of like, oh, this is the stuff. These are the things. But I think on a, like a nerdy technical level, like how these were made, I think that's important. I didn't get to it. Um, a lot of people that create still lives, like they sit there and they draw it. And I did a lot of drawing, but the, all of the collage bits, they were actually these objects photographed and then they were cut out on a circuit cutter. So it's not my approximation of what the contour of those shapes are. That's the contour of what those shapes are. So when you look at it, there's no kind of like um, fuss about it. That's the exact lemon that sits on that pedestal. That is the exact little um, cup that's made out of tape. So I, I think that it's it's everything is kind of wrapped up. It gets wrapped up really tight um, as far as their interrelationships. It's a nice, good summation, some new content too. Uh, Terry Bluebird says, Rye, aside from this refreshingly new content, I must say your vocabulary and ability to tie words to bouquet of colors is inspiring. Um, and then uh, Babs Ringgold says, congratulations on your show, Rye. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Hoping she can come see it in person. And then Stephen Winterton asks, you talk early on about color and how Tampa inspired the presence of that in your work. Color seems like such an important key part of visual observation. Since the use of color has such a grand presence in your work, does the use of color play a role in how you want your viewer to interact with the work? I think that's a great question, Stephen. Thank you. Um, I think that um, you'll see a kind of like how color is expressed and how it is interpreted um, in the exhibition is kind of important. In the images, um, I'm taking a lot of liberty in how to interpret color and there's even like uh, the energy of the color is kind of tuned down so that I hope that people are focusing on the arrangement and the shape. But then if you look at some of the objects on the platforms, they are really signaling like loud, um, like if you see like there's a, uh, a hazard orange piece of like spandex in there that I just couldn't let go of. But um, I think that that relationship of like found color, mixed color, and kind of like arrived at kind of like synthetic relationships of color, I think are incredibly important. Um, but I also, I'm like, I can speak about color uh, in a very academic way. And I think that is maybe the most boring way that one could interact with the ideas or with color. I think color is just like one of the most wonderful, luscious, sensual experiences as human beings that we can have. I, I when I worked for Stiver School for the Arts, I had a great boss. And whenever I had a bad day, uh, she would she would realize and she would say, get over here. And she had a brown paper bag, but she had someone take highly pigmented magenta screen printing ink and coat the interior of it. And she would just open it and she said, visual first aid. <laughs> and I think about that all the time, all the time. And I'm always trying to kind of create moments of visual first aid for myself and hopefully for my viewers. So I, I, that's going to stick with me, visual first aid through color. Um, I have a final comment from Jade. It says, hello, my name is Jade. I'm a student at HCC. Rye, I love the subtle colors used in the background of the prints with the little pops of color coming from the pieces that we see in both the physical exhibits and the 2D prints. I took art history back in high school, and your prints reminded me of Klimt's The Kiss because of the use of both shapes and color. Thank you, and Amanda, for such a great conversation tonight. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I think that's just a, the perfect way to kind of bring this to a close. Um, as, as we end, we'll replay a slideshow so you can kind of experience the work, but we encourage you to come see it. But I also want to officially invite you all to our next event on Thursday, March 11th at 6. We'll host the opening reception for Engulfed, 
which will be a group exhibition featuring local artists alongside works from the USF Contemporary Art Museum's permanent art collection. I hope we see many of you there. We'll have artists Carol Mickett and Robert Stackhouse, Brandy Ziegel and Kenny Jensen, who will speak in conversations with myself and co-curator Sarah Howard about how their work responds to issues facing the environment and sustainability. Um, we'll throw a link there for the registration in Zoom into the chat. And uh, again, come see the show, though it's lovely to see it uh, via photos here. Um, you're welcome to come and make an appointment to see it. It's open through April 29th. You can book an appointment on our website, Gallery 114. So with that, our we officially come to a close. Thank you so much, Rai, for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, yeah, it's great to talk to you. Likewise. Um, everyone, thanks again for being here with us tonight. Take care and be well. <laughs>